Hello and welcome. My name is Maria Recupero and I'm a registered dietitian at Toronto Rehab. Today we're going to be talking about ways that you can lower your cholesterol through diet. By the end of this session, you'll be able to recognize food choices that are healthy for your heart. You'll also be able to identify sources of saturated, trans and unsaturated fats. And most importantly, you'll be able to interpret and understand the nutrition information on food labels. Let's start with a bit of background information. There's two main types of cholesterol in the body. The first is LDL, or low density lipoprotein. The next is HDL, or high density lipoprotein. Low density lipoprotein, or LDL, is often referred to as the bad cholesterol. An easy way of remembering LDL as the bad cholesterol, remember that L is for lousy. It's lousy because it acts like a dump truck in our system, dumping garbage. And for that reason, here at the center, we aim for a target of less than two. High density lipoprotein, or HDL, is often referred to as the good cholesterol. And an easy way of remembering it as the good cholesterol, remember H is for healthy. And it acts like a garbage truck. It picks up the garbage that LDL is dumping, it brings it back to the liver where it's recycled and cleared out of the system. Here at the center, we aim for a target of greater than 1 for HDL in men and greater than 1.3 for women. Because HDL is so important, ways that we can increase HDL is by making sure we're participating in regular exercise. Of course, achieving and maintaining a healthy weight is also important, not smoking and improving your diet, specifically including healthy fats in your diet. And so we'll elaborate on this part in more detail as we carry on. There's another type of cholesterol in the body referred to as triglycerides. These are the storage fats. They're made by the liver when we consume too much food. So when we're taking in more than the body requires. High triglycerides cause the blood to become sticky, clumpy, okay, and this is something we want to avoid. Here at the center, we aim for a triglyceride level of less than 1.7. So ways that we can lower triglycerides is, of course, reducing your fat intake, okay, but also redu reducing the amount of sugar and processed or refined carbohydrates in the diet. So what I mean by that is cutting back on desserts, regular pop, candy, um, packaged food items, instant noodles, that kind of thing, white bread for, uh, as another example. Another way that we can help lower our triglycerides is by cutting back on the amount of alcohol we consume. Once again, making sure that you're at a healthy weight and including omega-3 fats in the diet. So these are very healthy fats and you're probably familiar with the fact that fish tend to be very high in omega-3s. So including omega-3 fats can help lower triglyceride levels. The main cause of high blood cholesterol, people often think it's the cholesterol in food, that's the culprit, and in fact it's not. Saturated and trans fats are what raise LDL in the body. So it's focusing on these types of fats, making sure that we're taking in less to help improve our cholesterol. Another way of identifying trans fats is the term partially hydrogenated or hydrogenated oils and fats. If you see that on a label, that's a clue that you're taking in trans fats. Remember that cholesterol is only found in animal products. And I emphasize this point, this will make more sense to you as we get into our discussion on reading labels and focusing on claims, because it can be very misleading. So cholesterol is only found in animal products. And you want to aim for less than 200 milligrams per day for your intake of cholesterol from food. 
how can nutrition help? So here is some more information that proves that improving your diet can help reduce cholesterol, specifically the LDL, that lousy cholesterol. So when we consume less than 7% of total calories for saturated and trans fats, that can potentially reduce LDL anywhere from 8 to 10%. Keeping cholesterol intake to less than 200 milligrams for the day, that brings about a 3 to 5 percent reduction in LDL. So you can see that by focusing on the saturated and trans fat has a far greater impact on lowering LDL than cholesterol in food. Losing 10 pounds can also help lower your LDL anywhere from 5 to 8 percent. And I think this is reassuring because oftentimes we hear, oh, we need to lose 50, 60, maybe even 100 pounds, but even just 10 pounds alone can bring about favorable effects. Of course, including fiber, specifically soluble fiber, which we'll elaborate on later, that, that too can bring about a reduction in your LDL anywhere from 3 to 5 percent. When you consider all of these components, you can lower your LDL anywhere from 19 to 28 percent just from diet alone. So let's get into a discussion on saturated fat. As mentioned earlier, saturated fat raises LDL, the bad cholesterol in the body. Another way of identifying saturated fat is that for the most part, they're solid, they're hard at room temperature, and they're only found in animal products. So if it comes from an animal, it's got saturated fat as well as cholesterol. Of course, there's an exception to every rule. Tropical oils, palm oil, coconut, coconut milk, coconut oils, cocoa butter. These are plant-based, typically liquid, at room temperature, but they're very high in saturated fat. So these are other components to keep an eye out for. Ways that we can lower saturated fat, well, the obvious perhaps, um, by removing the visible fat. So the skin on poultry, um, trimming any marbling, the white stuff that you see in the picture here, that's very high in saturated fat. Changing cooking methods, so avoid deep frying um, or frying of foods using heavy oils, baking, boiling, that kind of thing would be preferred. Steaming is another example. Choosing leaner cuts of meat also goes a long way in terms of helping to lower the amount of saturated fat we're taking in. And do consider having fish more often than red meat or consider including a vegetarian meal throughout the, uh, throughout the week. So cooking with tofu, which is soy based, or legumes like your kidney beans, chickpeas, things of that nature. Having them more often, they're significantly lower in saturated fat or have no saturated fat and uh, are an alternative protein source. Other ways that we can lower saturated fat is by choosing low fat dairy products. So, with milk, choosing 1% or skim milk as opposed to homogenized milk. Again, you're taking in less saturated fat. Choosing a fat free yogurt that is sweetened with a, a sweetener because you can buy or you can find a low fat yogurt but it still may be, be very high in those sugars and that's that too is something you don't want. When it comes to cheeses, the lower the percent milk fat or MF that appears on the label, the better it is for you in terms of the content. So MF stands for milk fat, sometimes you may see a percent BF, that BF stands for butter fat, so less than 10% would be ideal. And of course, consume cheese in moderation. Trans fats. Trans fats are made through the process of hydrogenation, which I had alluded to earlier. What is hydrogenation? Well, hydrogenation is when food companies take a liquid fat, okay, so it starts off being liquid. In fact, it starts off being healthy. But through the chemical process of hydrogenation, it turns into a solid. Okay? 
And in that process, the chemical structure, the chemical nature of the, of the oil, the fat, changes and produces these trans fats. They're not healthy for us. Okay, why, they're not healthy for us because they raise the bad cholesterol, but at the same time, they lower the good cholesterol in our body. So why do they do this in the first place? Well, because it increases shelf life. It oftentimes improves the texture. Um, it gives more uniformity to, to the product. Okay, and in some, some cases too, it may improve taste. But again, they're very harmful to our health. Typically, foods that have a high amount of trans fat or hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated oils are from the picture here, which you can see, that's your hard stick margarines, even some soft margarines. So we'll talk about margarine in just a moment, which one to choose. Bakery items, okay, vegetable shortening, your donuts, a lot of restaurant foods use trans fat oils. We're starting to see changes too occur. So many companies, many restaurants, are changing the types of oils that they're using and they're they're trans fat free but be careful because we're still taking in a high amount of saturated fat and total fat and that's not something that we want to do oftentimes there's many questions posed about which to use butter or margarine butter contains a high amount of saturated fat Margarines, on the other hand, if you're choosing a non-hydrogenated margarine, it's vegetable oil based and therefore healthier for our heart. So be sure to read the label. If you clearly do not see the term or the word non-hydrogenated listed on the label, chances are that margarine has trans fats. You can always read the ingredients list as well. Moving to the healthy fats now and a discussion on unsaturated fats. So a type of good fat is what we call polyunsaturated fat. So why are these the good fats? Well, they're good because they can actually lower the bad cholesterol. They lower LDL. A way of identifying a healthy fat is that they're liquid at room temperature. So some examples of polyunsaturated fats, you can find them in safflower oil, corn oil, soybean, sesame oil, sunflower oil, as well as the seed components of these, of these oils. Another type of healthy fat is what we call monounsaturated fats. Again, why are they good? Because they too can lower the bad cholesterol. Monounsaturated fats, though specifically, may in fact help raise your HDL. Again, exercise has more of a, an impact on HDL levels, but there's, there's some evidence that suggests there's some benefit from including these, these fats. They too are liquid at room temperature. And so some examples of monounsaturated fat, this is where your olive oil comes in. Avocados, canola oil, peanuts, almonds, peanut oil, just to give you a few examples. This chart speaks volumes. You can see here there's lots of colors. So the red indicates the amount of saturated fat in selected oils. And then we have some blues, some gold, and a bit of orange. So allow me to explain this further. Let's jump down to the bottom of this chart. You'll see here coconut oil. Coconut oil has a lot of red. You can see that more than 90% of its makeup consists of saturated fats. Butter fat, just above coconut oil, has almost 70% saturated fat. Okay, so this is one of the reasons why we recommend using a non-hydrogenated margarine as opposed to butter. Up at the top or closer to the center, you can see olive oil. Olive oil has a lot of yellow, and that's why it, that's a, a, a identifying that it's a monounsaturated fat, and that's how it gets that classification. And the same with canola oil. You can also see that canola oil and soybean oil, which is again just underneath the olive oil there, they have some orange indicated. So this shows you the amount of omega-3 
in these oils. So oftentimes people think that canola oil then is the preferred oil because it appears first on the chart as well. But remember folks, this chart was put out by the canola people. So, you know, <laughs> use caution. But having said that, canola oil and olive oil, either one, are the preferred oils for cooking. Okay, so do try to use them more often. The recommendation is to include fish more often as much as or as as much as two to three times a week. Okay, but not just any fish, and fish and chips certainly don't count. So when we say include fish two to three times a week, we're referring to fatty fish. So to give you a few examples, that's your salmon, that's your mackerel, sardines, herring, trout. Okay. Why include fish on a regular basis if you can? Because, <clears throat> again, they contain these omega-3 fats. And they may also help to reduce the risk of irregular heartbeat, which is often referred to as arrhythmias. They also play a role in reducing clotting. And as I mentioned before, they can help lower your triglyceride levels. The majority of people do not even get half of what's required for their omega-3 fat intake. So do try to include fish more often. If you don't like fish, there are other sources of omega-3 fats that you can turn to, one of which is ground flaxseed. The flaxseed itself needs to be ground up in powder form in order for your body to absorb the oils from it. So the recommendation is one to two tablespoons a day, and most people add it topically to their cereals, um, they can add it to yogurt, oftentimes people will use it in baking. Okay, so those are some ways in which you can use it. You can buy the flaxseed in its whole form, and if you have a coffee grinder at home, just grinding up a little bit at a time is beneficial. The seeds themselves in their whole form have a very long shelf life. You can literally keep them in your cupboard for up to a year. Once you grind them though, they tend to go rancid very quickly. So if you do grind a certain amount at one time, be sure to store it in the refrigerator or even the freezer, and it's good for up to three months. Canola oil, as mentioned, also is another source of omega-3 fats, as well as your walnuts. There are the omega-3 eggs. And we're starting to see omega-3 fats added to a number of different products. We're seeing it in breads, we're seeing it in cheeses, we're seeing it appear in milk. So while omega-3 fats are important for our health, and we may think that's a good thing, use common sense, because where omega-3 is added to something like a high-fat cheddar cheese, be careful, because while you're getting some good fat, you're getting more of the harmful fats that you don't necessarily want. There's a lot of discussion about eggs, how many eggs to be included, and oftentimes people will eliminate eggs from their diet altogether. In fact, having the whole egg that's including the egg yolk anywhere two to three times a week is part of a heart healthy diet. So don't be afraid to include eggs two to three times a week. That's part of eating healthy. Okay, Egg whites you can have every day. We're going to compare two sets of meals. What you see appear first is a high fat meal. So let's take a close look at this. Having fried chicken, about four ounces, that's typically about this, a little bit bigger than the size of the palm of my hand. Okay, that fried chicken, that portion, will give you about 20 grams of fat. When you include french fries with that, you can add another 15 grams of fat. A high fat dressing on a salad, add another 16 grams of fat. One cup, eight ounces, or 250 mils of whole milk, that contains eight grams of fat. And for dessert, if you were to have a piece of apple pie with one scoop of ice cream, you could add another 25 grams of fat to that meal. Your total for that meal, as you can see, is 84 grams. Now, that may not mean very much to you, but when you consider following a heart-healthy diet, the recommendation, generally speaking, for a man is to aim for a fat intake of less than 60 grams for the day. For women, we recommend aiming for a total fat intake of less than 50 grams for the day. So you can see here, this one meal, you've exceeded that. 
Now let's compare how we can take this high fat meal and turn it into a heart healthy alternative. Okay, so when we take a look at this low fat meal, when we bake fat chicken the same portion as opposed to frying it, you bring the fat down to six grams. So that's huge savings there. Having a baked potato as opposed to french fries, you get virtually no fat, even if you are adding some low fat sour cream. Making your own dressing using two teaspoons of olive oil, that will add 10 grams of fat. And remember, that's good fat. Switching to 1% milk as opposed to whole milk, that brings the fat content down to two and a half grams. And dessert, if you were to have a baked apple with one scoop of low fat frozen yogurt, you're getting two grams of fat as opposed to 25 in the previous example. So your total for this meal now is less than 21 grams of fat which still keeps you within the recommendations for keeping fat intake to a minimum. So hopefully this is an example of a way of eating that you can live with or at least work toward. Switching now to other foods that are important for consideration for overall health, particularly for lowering cholesterol. So oftentimes you hear that fiber is important and specifically soluble fiber is important. So examples of soluble fiber are things like your oatmeal, barley, psyllium containing breakfast cereals like your all bran buds, okay, metamucil would, would be an example of that as well. Ground flaxseed appears here too. That's another source of soluble fiber. So what do we mean by soluble fiber? Well, again, when water comes in contact with the fiber, well, think about oatmeal and barley, right? It tends to swell and form a gel-like substance. That's the action that's incurring in your system to help reduce and lower the cholesterol. So these, the, that's the action that we want. Other examples of soluble fiber, you get that in your fruits. So specifically the pectin in fruit, like strawberries, apples, pears, other citrus fruits, your root vegetables, parsnips, carrots, turnip, and of course the legumes, kidney beans, chickpeas, dal. Okay, so these are foods that you wanna to try to include more often and on a regular basis. How much total fiber do we need? Well, we should be aiming to receive 30 grams of fiber a day. So what are some ways in which we can help to increase the amount of fiber we're taking in? Well, in the morning, it's a good idea to start off with a high fiber cereal. If you take a look at, at the package of all bran buds, one third of a cup of a psyllium containing cereal will give you about 12 grams of fiber. So that's almost half of what's recommended for the day. It makes it easier to make up the difference as you carry on. Choose whole grains whenever possible. Okay, you want the whole grain. Whole wheat is not good enough. Read the, read the ingredients list, read the label, make sure it says whole grain. Try to go vegetarian as much as possible. As I mentioned before, consider one vegetarian meal throughout the week where you are including or cooking with beans. That's a great way of increasing your fiber intake. Always focus on vegetables. Be sure to include plenty of fruits and vegetables throughout the day. They work great as snacks as well. Consider sprinkling some wheat, some oat bran, or even ground flax to cereals and other foods. That's another way in which we can increase the fiber. Other foods that are also part of a heart healthy diet include your soy protein. Okay, there's some evidence that shows that 25 grams of soy protein each day can lower your LDL by 5%. More recent evidence shows that, in fact, soy protein may not have that much of an impact on lowering cholesterol. But when you consider the source, foods like tofu, and I'll give you a few more examples in a moment, they're very low in saturated fat, they're a wonderful alternative to eating meat, so they are part of a heart healthy diet and you know, may also give you greater variety too. 
Other sources of soy protein here, uh, you can find them in your fortified soy beverage. Choose the original flavor as opposed to the chocolate, strawberry, vanilla flavors. They tend to be higher in sugar. Tofu, as I mentioned, they come in different forms. Tofu doesn't really taste like anything. That's a good thing about it because it takes on the flavors of whatever it is that you're adding to it. So consider that. There are what we call texturized vegetable protein foods. So this is your veggie burgers, um, there's veggie ground round, foods that taste like meat, but in fact they're soy based. These are again very, very low in fats, especially the saturated fat. Use caution though, read the label because oftentimes they're high in sodium. Soy nuts, soy beans, soy cheeses. Again, these are some other examples of where you can find soy protein. So just to summarize, what are some ways that we can lower our cholesterol? Well, be sure that you're including more foods that are higher in soluble fiber. Focusing on more plant-based foods. So again, try to include beans more often. Consider including soy in your diet. Emphasize fruits and vegetables. They are key to achieving a healthy heart as well as lowering cholesterol. And be sure that you're including healthy fats in your diet. So it's not realistic and it's not healthy to eliminate all the fat in your diet. But what you want to do is lower your intake of the bad fats, those saturated and trans fats, and replace them with good fats like the unsaturated fats, um, the omega-3s and the monos. Okay, we're changing gears now. We're gonna turn our attention to reading labels. People are often very confused when it comes to label reading. You may look at a product package, um, do your best to interpret it, but it still doesn't make sense. So the hope is by the end of the session, it'll make sense to you and um, that hopefully will help you make more informed, better choices for yourself when you're doing your day-to-day -day shopping. There are three places where we can uh, get information off of a label. The first is the list of ingredients. Secondly, the nutrition facts panel. And thirdly, the nutrition claims. Let's start with the ingredients list. The ingredients list is found on all packaged items. Okay? You're not told exactly how much you're getting of these ingredients, but the order in which they're listed gives you an idea if you're getting a lot or a little. So all the items that are listed in the ingredients list, they appear in the order in which they've been used in the most quantity and go in descending order by weight. So in this example here of the granola bar, you can see the first item is rolled oats, the second item is sugar. So this tells you right off the bat that you're getting a high amount of sugar from this product. The Nutrition Facts Panel. This is where all the numbers appear. So for heart health, and again also for managing diabetes, just making informed food choices, the key areas to focus on are first and foremost the serving size. And I'll elaborate on that in a moment. Oftentimes people will look at calories, and that gives you an idea of how many calories you're taking in. But be sure that you're focusing on how much fiber there is in a product, how much sodium, and of course, how much fat, specifically the type of fat. So on the label, it's listed, or you will be, you will be told how much saturated and trans fat you'll be receiving. The serving size. I think this is the most important piece of information on the label. You need to start at the top because all the information at the bottom, for example, how much fat, how much sodium, how much fiber, that's all based on the portion that's stated on that package. So in this example, you can see here the serving size is based on 125 milliliters or half a cup. Okay? Without looking at that information, the numbers aren't going to mean much to you. So make sure you're looking at the serving size. People oftentimes will overlook this. 
You may be wondering about the percentages, those numbers on the, on the side margin. We'll look at a few examples in a moment, but I'll just explain what the percent daily value is. The percent daily value can make life easy for you. Okay? It's easy to compare foods this way. It helps you to see if the food is getting a lot or a little of a particular nutrient. Remember that percent daily values are set for the general population and they're based, well the fat and carbohydrate intake is based on a 2,000 calorie per day diet. So you may not necessarily need 2,000 calories a day. You may in fact be aiming for lower than that, but reading the percent daily value still gives you an idea if you're getting a lot or a little of a particular nutrient. So when you think about that percent, everything's out of 100, okay? So by the end of the day, there are certain nutrients that you want to be getting 100% of. And of course, there are other nutrients that you don't necessarily care to get 100% of. So for example, you want to be sure that you're at least getting close, if not 100% of your daily value when it comes to fiber, as well as your vitamins and minerals. The exception would be fat, especially saturated and trans fat, and sodium. We don't necessarily want to achieve 100% of those nutrients by the end of the day. Okay? So, how to use a percent daily value? You can compare different food items, and by looking at the percent daily value, you can see if one item offers more in the way of fiber or less in the way of fat, and that can help you base your, your decisions or your choices. So here's an example that we can work through together. For the percent daily value, this is canned vegetable clam chowder. So if you look at the amount of sodium, all right, even though you may not know what the percent daily value is, I'll tell you that in a moment, by looking at the amount of sodium, you can see here that in a one cup measure, okay, one cup of this soup, you would be receiving 960 milligrams of sodium, which contributes to 40% of what's recommended for your daily value. Would you say that's a lot or a little? Okay. In fact, that would be a lot. Because when it comes to sodium, you don't necessarily want to achieve 100%. So the other part of this is you need to consider how much you would consume. Not everybody would have one cup. In fact, most people may have two cups. So if you double the amount, of the serving size, then that would mean that you would be receiving 80% of your daily value for sodium. Another example. So looking at the percent daily value in terms of vitamins. So once again, that percent daily value tells you if there's a little or a lot of a particular nutrients. Okay? So again in this example, one cup in this one cup of this product, if you look down at calcium, this is telling you that in this one cup measure, this is contributing to 30% of what's recommended for your daily value for calcium. So again, would you think this is a lot or a little? As my slide suggests, you can use 15% as your cutoff. So if a percent daily value is greater than 15, then you can assume you're getting a good amount or a high amount. If it's lower than 15%, then that's a low amount. So in this case, we can pretend this is yogurt. In this one cup of yogurt, you're getting 30% of your daily value for calcium. That would be a lot. That would be a good thing because calcium is something that we need. Looking for fat. I like sharing this example um, with people because this happened uh, in real life. Okay, I had a woman come into my office who said that at least three times a week she was having the Swiss fondue entree as part of as, as her dinner. She assured me, however, that it was low in fat. 
So I was a bit skeptical and I asked her to bring the package in so we could look at it together. And sure enough, when looking at the nutrition facts panel, you can see that the total fat was four and a half grams. Only four and a half grams of fat. Not bad, until you take a closer look at the serving size. So you can see here that the serving size is based on two tablespoons, or 30 grams. 30 grams is an ounce. I'm going to draw your attention over to the left side here. You may have noticed this already, but the package itself is 400 grams. That's nearly a pound of cheese. So in essence, this was not a low-fat entree that this woman was consuming. In fact, when you do the calculations, you can see that she was consuming 800 calories, 60 grams of fat, 2.7 grams of trans fats, when the goal is to try to keep it as low as realistically possible. Her saturated fat intake was 33 grams, and her total sodium intake was over 2,100 milligrams, just from this entree, because she neglected to look at the serving size. So I make a point of sharing this experience with people because it happens day to day, and I see it happen quite a bit. Be sure to look at the serving, then look at the other information, because all this information is based on that stated serving, and then you'll want to consider how much you're going to be consuming in relation to the stated serving size. A few more examples. It's also important to look for fiber, so not every product will contain fiber, but in this example here with the psyllium containing cereal, you can see that in one third of a cup, you're getting 12 grams of fiber or 48% of your daily value. So that's pretty remarkable and it's easier again to achieve your, your overall goal for fiber for the day. When you're reading labels, look for whole grain breads, cereals, whenever possible. And I stress the word whole grain. Aim to get at least five grams of fiber per serving. Won't happen all the time, but do try to keep that in mind. Finally, the nutrition claims. Before we go any further, I want to encourage you to focus on the Nutrition Facts panel because, as the name suggests, that's where the facts are. So hopefully you feel a little more comfortable interpreting and understanding the labels. When it comes to the claims, food companies aren't lying. However, the way the claim is stated can be very, very misleading. So if you can ignore the claims and focus on the Nutrition Facts panel, you're better off. But I want to explain what some of these claims mean. Starting first with cholesterol free or no cholesterol. Remember that cholesterol only comes from animals. So when I see this claim, I often think of potato chips because you see this claim appear on potato chips. Well, if you think about that for a moment, potato chips, they come from a vegetable, right? So of course they're not going to have any cholesterol. However, it doesn't mean that chips are low in fat. So again, this claim can be very misleading. Fat-free, low-fat, or light. I'll explain which each of these is. Fat-free, by law, food companies have to meet certain requirements to, to bear this claim on their product. When it comes to fat-free, that means that the item cannot contain more than 0.5 grams of fat per serving. Okay. Low fat means that the item cannot contain more than 3 grams of fat per serving, or 100 grams. And light means that the product has 50% less fat compared to the regular version. Now you're not expected to remember all these definitions, but what I want to highlight here is that when a product has a label of low fat or a claim of low fat, yes, it is low in fat, but it may also be high in sugar to compensate for the removal of fat. So make sure that you're not just focusing on one aspect of the label, that you're looking at the whole picture. The next claim, light, spelled L-I-T-E. I think of olive oil here, because I've seen it appear on olive oil. 
Now, if you think about that for a moment and use common sense, you can't get a low-fat version of a pure fat. It doesn't exist. So what are they referring to here in the example of the olive oil? Well, light spelt this way, they're making reference to its color. It's light in color. It's not very meaningful for trying to make wise choices based on our health. So try and be sure not to be um, misled with these claims. You'll also see this uh, claim appear on beer, like light beer. And in that example, it's making reference to the fact that it has lower calories. No sugar added or unsweetened. I think of juice here, all natural, um, freshly squeezed, it doesn't matter. Remember that juice has naturally occurring sugars and is high in calories. So the fact that there may be no sugar added to the product doesn't mean that there is no sugar available. Low sodium. Again, by definition, that means that no more than 40 milligrams per serving of sodium can, is contained in that product. Low sodium is different from low salt. So again, you can see how this can be very misleading and tricky, the terminology. Low salt, on the other hand, means that the product contains 50% less salt than the regular version. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's low in sodium. And I think a good example here is soy sauce. When you look at one tablespoon of soy sauce, there's a little over a thousand milligrams of sodium in the regular version. When you look at the light version, or the lower salt version of soy sauce, you may be getting anywhere from five to six hundred milligrams of sodium in that one tablespoon. So while that's better, it's still quite high in sodium. Finally, I'm going to leave you with two websites for your reference. If you want more information, if you want to work through a few more examples in terms of reading labels, I'd like to direct you to the following website, www.healthyeatingisinstore.ca. Here you can have um, work through some more examples and be more familiar with reading labels. And the other is um, a, a health letter called Nutrition Action. The website, again, is www.cspinet.org. And here you can get up-to-date information on nutrition and health. It, they're a not-for-profit organization. The subscription for the year is $15, so it's very affordable. And here they can also not only keep you up-to-date on nutrition and health, but they also look at different products out there in the market and they will rate them in terms of how healthy they are from a fat sodium fiber perspective. So I think you'll find that uh, quite helpful and informative. People often ask for heart healthy um, recipe books. There are several out there. I've got two here to start you off. One is Ann Lindsay's Lighthearted Everyday Cooking and the other is the Heart Smart Shopper. Thank you.